Hi everyone, this is Dax Stokes of the Vampire Historian Podcast. It's great to be back after a short hiatus over the first part of the summer, um, but I'm happy to be back with some new ideas and new um, information about podcasting that I learned this weekend at the Podcast Movement 2015 conference. We're over a thousand podcasters from around the country, actually around the world, all met in Fort Worth, Texas. We had keynote speakers such as Mark Marin and Sarah Koenig from Serial and several other uh, really important uh, people in the co- podcasting field. Um, one of the things that I did at this conference was I conducted my first interview, and this is going to be a new part of the podcast. Hopefully once a month I'll be interviewing a different vampire-related author, um, and this is the first uh, interview that I've uh, done. So actually this is my first interview ever, so if you have any comments or uh, you know questions, please feel free to let me know. Um, but this interview is with author Eric Newsom, who is the Senior Vice President for Original Content at Audible. Um, previously, he was the Vice President of Programming at NPR. Um, he's the author of three books. Um, his first book is called Parental Advisory, Music Censorship in America. His newest book is Giving Up the Ghost, a story about friendship, 80s rock, a lost scrap of paper, and what it means to be haunted. Uh, that's more of a memoir. Uh, but the book we talked about is his second book, The Dead Travel Fast, Stalking Vampires from Nosferatu to Count Chocula. It's a very interesting book, very easy read, um, and I highly suggest that everyone have a listen to it. Um, but this is my interview with Eric Newsom, and please stick around for uh, um, you know more information at the end of the episode and for all the upcoming episodes that we'll have. Thanks. And I uh, wanted to add that this was recorded um, at one of the exhibits for the Mobile Pro uh, mobile podcasting we used, Studio Number Five. So I'd like to thank uh, Sean Smith of the Mobile Pro for allowing us to use the studio. First off, I have to say uh, a compliment to you is that my wife, who hates vampires, <laughs> everything about them, cannot stand the fact that I l- like to do this, um, read the first 60 pages of your book the other night in about an hour and loved it. So oh, thank you. that's a big compliment. She, uh, she cannot stand the topic at all. <laughs> so. Um, wanted to pass that along, but just a few uh, questions about your book. Uh, it's been a while since uh, the book came out, so mm-hmm. hopefully you can we can ask a few questions. But one of the things I wanted to start with was just what made you want to write this book uh, after your first book being about music piracy. What led you to this one? It's about actually about music censorship. The censorship. Um, yeah. I I think that um, I was kind of tooling around with a bunch of different ideas to what to write about things and I, and, and I tend to write about things that I don't have a tremendous amount of expertise in mm-hmm. and uh, the writing process is really about me learning and kind of coming at something and just saying wow this is really fascinating to me and I'm also attracted to topics that um, uh, seem very simple on the surface but then as you look, the, look at them at a deeper level you find them to reveal quite a bit mm-hmm. and so I was, um, I actually mentioned it, I believe in the book, uh, I was sitting eating breakfast one morning and I saw uh, George Bush make a reference to energy vampires, which were wall warts that draw power, Sure. Um, even though they're not charging anything. And uh, I saw an ad in a magazine and I was eating cereal, which happened to be Count Chocula. Mm-hmm. And it, it, so here's like all of a sudden in my life, a number of vampire references happening within a couple minutes of each other. And it was like the middle of summer when this happened. Mm-hmm. I'm like, how, how is that possible? And uh, so I said, that's a really interesting idea. Mm-hmm. And um, of this whole idea of vampires and how people use vampires uh, to talk about other things and to represent other things. So that's really how it started. I'm like, I wonder, I wonder why that is that way. And, and sure. then this book came out. Well, one of the things that you notice through the book is that you're very persistent in your pursuit I mean, I've never seen anybody who, most of us in the vampire studies field, focus on one aspect, and you kind of tackled all of the aspects all at once and were persistent with a lot of your things, especially with trying to get a hold of the community, the vampire right. community people, and right. um, going all the way to Romania and everything. So that's great. Is that kind of just your personality? I think it is. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm constantly asking myself in my writing and in my radio work, too, Am I doing something that someone's going to care about or they're going to be interested in reading or is more than surface deep, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, sometimes the answer to that is being willing to go places and do things that other people aren't mm-hmm. um, or being persistent in pursuing something that is very difficult to find. Sure. And sometimes the 
process and the story of finding that thing is actually more interesting than when you actually mm -hmm. find it. If that makes sense. So, uh, since you wrote this book, I would actually call the time you were writing the book not even the vampire renaissance that we're having now. No, it so, came before it. Uh, it right. came before. So, what kind of changes have you seen? Are you still keeping up with anything at all? Or no, um, outside of that, I still have a soft spot for it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I still and and people oddly assume that I am really interested in sure. it, and so they, you know, they want to ask my thoughts on the latest vampire movie mm -hmm. or you know. The, Am I still watching True Blood? Because, you know, this book came out. The soft cover actually came out the same time that the first season of True Blood and the first Twilight movie were coming mm -hmm. out. Uh, that's when the paperback came out. Sure. The paperback sold much better than the hardback. It was mm -hmm. because there was all this interest, and right. I was everywhere, right? Right. So it was good timing for me. Um, but, you know, since then, it's, it's a subject I still care about, and mm -hmm. I still actually keep in touch with a number of people who are in that book. Sure. Um, and uh, like, there's a couple who own a. Uh, uh, their, they turn their home into a haunted um, uh, attraction every every right. October up in uh, up in um, in Oregon. And I still we're Facebook friends, and, I, and I, I chat with them periodically. We've gotten together and visit, so so I so it's still a part of my life. And then there are, there are still people who much like your wife who discovered this book and read it mm -hmm. and then they write me they're like this is hilarious and they're experiencing it for the first time right, right. things that are happened 10 11 years ago sure yeah. we actually have a, a monster recreation house about 45 minutes from here the entire house really uh, I haven't been yet but the same thing a couple turned their entire house into a recreation of the monster dimension yeah so next time you come we'll have to go see it <laughs> um, speaking of the movies so one of the things you did in your book was you watched about 216 movies. Yeah. And most of them you rated fairly low. <laughs> after all of those... Most that of you, them, Almost all of them. After all that, the ones that you watched, was Shadow of the Vampire still, you think, one of the best ones? Oh, yeah. It, it still was my favorite. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was... And I think the reasons why was it took... It played with history in a way that actually made... Um, the, the fictionalized elements of it made reality more interesting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And kind of gives you when that movie you know came out, it wasn't there wasn't very much uh, attraction to it. It's right. most of its notoriety has happened far after its mm -hmm. actual existence. Um, uh, you know, very few people have, actually. I think almost no one saw it when it came out because right. it was it was um, pulled. But um, uh, in the years since, it's become quite a thing, and and uh, but people don't understand what that vampire meant to people at that time. Sure, right. and they just announced they're going to remake Nosferatu again. Yes, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we can't we can't uh, find new ideas <laughs> very much in Hollywood. Um, have you? We just talked about it, but have you seen any of the newer artsy or type movies like Let the Right One In yeah. or Byzantium? Or do you think? What do you think about any of those? Let, Let the Right One In was a was a really fun movie. To mm -hmm. me. Um, it's very interesting. It's very interesting and original spin on it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, uh, it's um, it would probably be up in that rank of like a better one of the better ones to me. Uh, is a watching experience, a viewing experience, and a very very original take on that that idea. That one and Only Lovers Left Alive are right now the big movies. Uh -huh. You know, is taking the vampire to a different level from Twilight or right. the almost 300 versions of Dracula that we have <laughs> yeah, now yeah, yeah. and uh, so that's interesting um, then the same thing with books have changed quite a bit too I, in your book you comment that you know Anne Rice isn't doing vampires anymore and of course now she's gotten full back into it and yeah. doing all that again so it's so much has changed on a, and with the community the, it seems like the vampire community these days is now a lot of teenagers and a lot of people online just you know, it's getting a lot more role playing. It's one of the things, my podcast doesn't focus on them at all. Uh, mm -hmm. I stick to the folklore and the history for the most part. But um, just, it, it, you know, have you kept up with any of those people too and seen how that's changed? Any of the ones that you met in the community or? Some of them. Really? Some, mm -hmm. uh, some are easier to keep track of than others. Um, there are people who are happy with the way they were depicted in my book. Mm -hmm. There's some people who, over time, just became less and less pleased with it. Sure. Who were fine at first, and then when they saw the world react to it, they kind of changed mm -hmm. their tune a little bit. But, um, uh, you know, um, so it's interesting because all those young people who are kind of coming into to vampire appreciation, you mm -hmm. know, 
every, everyone who was who who is in, interested in this topic was a newbie at, at first, right? Sure. And and they're just finding vampires to mean the exact same thing to them that it does to other generations. Mm-hmm. It's just um, uh, the vampires that they find cool are different. Right. <laughs> what was it like um, meeting Jean Youngson? I'm interested. She's a yeah. She's she's a big name. We've I've ne- we've never met, but we we correspond a lot. She sends. Have you, does she ever send you mail? Because she likes to put bat stickers on her. I don't know if you've ever gotten yeah, any yeah. of those. Yeah, I've gotten those. Before. Some of those. I haven't heard too. from her in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was walking in Washington Square Park mm-hmm. by her building and thought of her and thought you know, I mean, probably, you know I should look her up and say hi to her. Um, um, I'm not even sure she's in that. Uh, I think she's still in the same place. Right. Uh, yeah. I am. It, I just thought it was, I, I loved the part about how how she was telling you to stay away from the vampire community because that's, that's also <laughs> the kind of way I feel about it too. Like I just stay away from them and let them do their own thing. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I, well, I think in, in the very specific vampire community she was warning me away from were mm-hmm. the people who are more lifestyle oriented, right? Than the people who are interested in the history and lore. Mm-hmm. That's excellent. Um, it, just to kind of follow up or finish up, um, you've got so many different experiences. Uh, in your book, you know, from the haunted house that you worked at to the blood drinking. The, I love the story about the boat in Romania because that's one place I'd love to. I hope to go visit one day. But um, was there one story in the book that just you know that always just stands out to you as kind of the neatest experience that you had while working on the book? Um, uh, I, I I really have to say that trip to Romania, mm-hmm. um, and it was a great. For, uh, it was a great experience. It was a great writing experience, and it was a great experience for me, mostly because, you know, I I didn't do that for free. I paid my own fee sure. to go, and I didn't know what I was going to get. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I, I I went and I said, well, the worst thing that happens here is I can say I went to places that you know are are or are purported to be attached to the history of Vlad the Impaler or or, or um. um Romanian vampire lore like that's if nothing else happens I can at least get that out of it sure um, and uh, it became apparent to me the first night that it was going to be a very very different experience mm-hmm. and so I said you know what I just have to roll with this and so I remember at the first night we had a, like a welcome dinner while everyone was kind of still getting jet lagged getting over the jet lag and um, they were giving like a little bit of you know, kind of information on how it was going to work and what was going on. And I asked the tour operator um, if I could say a few words. Mm-hmm. And so I got up and I said, so here's the deal. I'm writing this book about vampires, but it's going to include all this first-person stuff. So what happens to us is going to be part of my story. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you don't want to be part of it, all you have to do is say so, and um, you don't exist. Sure. And you will never be a part of this, and I will figure out a way to work around you. And there was a couple people who said, as it went along, they're like, you know, I've thought about this, and I'm here on vacation. I really don't want this. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, absolutely cool. That's fine. And uh, But that experience uh, just ended up being so much more than I ever knew it would be. Sure. So it, was, it wasn't any particular experience on that trip. It was just the trip itself. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, you put a bunch of, you know, two dozen vampire enthusiasts in a quasi third world country for <laughs> for eight days and things are going to happen right yeah. that's great well I wanted to encourage other people to pick up your book um, it's still today probably as far as the non-fiction vampire books one of the easiest to read mm-hmm. the most engaging um, and it really does cover all the topics you've got the folklore the Dracula Stoker Vlad the community, everybody, all in one. And so I just wanted to encourage the people listening to uh, pick up a copy of the book. It's called The Dead Travel Fast, Stalking Vampires from Nosferatu to Count Chocula. And I just want to thank you for talking with me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And as always, you can find me at thevampirehistorian.com. You can email me anytime at thevampirehistorian at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook, The Vampire Historian, on Twitter at Vamp Historian, also on Instagram and Tumblr as well. You can check out some new features on TheVampireHistorian.com, including an Amazon store that's specifically uh, set up just for my listeners. 
And if you wouldn't mind going to iTunes and leaving a review, that would be very helpful. Thank you, and see you next time.